definitions are are social contracts. And so um, words definitions can change, but we need to pay attention as they're changing. Then there are terms, person, heartbeat, pain, fetal remains, and life that are much more complicated um, and also have definitions, but are much more in flux. So we'll come back, we'll come back to that. And then here's what I want to do, you know, a little history, talk about impacts, a little biology, and then come back to this point about defining terms. And I'm not very good. Well, first of all, it's our first day of classes. So the internet is heavily being used. So if it's a little glitchy, I apologize. And if you have questions um, as we go along, I'm not very good at both keeping track of what I'm trying to say and watch what you're trying to say. So Jocelyn's going to help me. And if you have questions or concerns or anything that you want clarification as we go along, just um, put it in chat and Jocelyn will flag me and we'll and we'll stop there for a moment. But okay, a little history. Um, there's such a lot of history to talk about, but a little bit. And I point to two books here that are excellent in being extremely well documented and giving us a ton of information. So Leslie Reagan's book um, looks at, at the earlier period when abortion was a crime and talks about the fact that hey, it was a crime, but there were an estimated around 1900, one to two million abortions a year. That's a big gap, but there, nobody was keeping very good statistics. One million is documented. More abortions in the United States in 1900 than now. Why? Well, there wasn't much birth control option. I mean, this is where people went for birth, for birth control. Um, and, the, and the fact that there were so many abortions led to efforts to provide alternatives in the birth control movement and efforts to legalize and make abortions safe because not all of those one to two million abortions were safe. And um, Reagan documents that really, really, really well. <clears throat> then in 1973, we get to Roe v. Wade, as everyone knows, and that really changed the discussions that before had been taking place in medical and other communities about how to do abortions and when to do abortions and where to do abortions and who can do abortions. That really changed the discussion and kind of closed off a lot of the discussion, I think, in problematic ways and really kind of ossified the discussion into a pro-choice and pro-life um, opposition, if you will. And so one emphasis on rights for women, and the discussion is so much about the rights and the rights for the women involved that there wasn't much, and Jocelyn mentioned this in the introduction, there wasn't much discussion about what we mean by all the different terms that are important. Um, whereas the pro-life group, groups, wanting to protect life have really been very effective in terms of the implications, you know, really been very effective in trying to redefine terms for their own purposes. And it's important to pay attention to that and notice what's happening and look for some middle grounds. Okay, so lots more things we could say about history, but that's just a little history, as I said. Now, a little biology, okay. Eggs and sperm cells, in the beginning, eggs and sperm cells come together in fertilization and produce an embryo. So an embryo results from that fertilization. So some people define that as conception and wanna make conception almost a weaponized term that, that we have to protect anything that happens at conception from that moment of fertilization. When the egg and sperm cell first come together, it takes a long time for fertilization to actually occur. But okay, um, and this can happen as a dish, in, in a dish with um, in vitro fertilization or in a woman. And the result is an embryo. And we could properly call that a pre-implantation embryo. Then at roughly five to 14 days is a process because everything's a process, not a moment. Um, implantation occurs in a uterus and we get a pregnancy. Some people refer to this as conception, that we have conception at the moment that we have the implantation and thereafter. Contraception is preventing either or both fertilization and implantation. So some people in legal terms and some people and legislators are in some, in some states are really confused about what contraception 
means and really want to impact what happens in the IVF clinics. But if implantation is key, then moments where there's an embryo in a dish are not impacted. So there's a lot of need for careful uh, negotiated, well, the negotiation of terms here. And just, just a side note that I won't really pursue too much, but that um, most fertilized eggs don't actually progress to birth. So that um, it's important to know most, like at least 50%, maybe more of eggs that get fertilized don't go on to birth. And so that should have implications about how we think about them. But terms, okay. So embryo, fetus, baby. Most people are really fuzzy about this. Um, and some people are really fuzzy on purpose, but fertilization technically by definition means to week eight of gestation because there's just a gradual process of cells changing and development occurring, but not a lot of differentiation happening. And so it's called an embryo. It's an embryonic thing. And then at eight weeks, roughly eight weeks, but eight weeks is the definition, there's a rudimentary form of the human body. And so all of the basic parts like hands and feet and heads and all that um, are there and the basic organs are there in very rudimentary form. It's not all working yet, but in structure, it's there in rudimentary form. And so actually back to the 18th century, this distinction of embryo and fetus has been made. And some people, refer to the time when there's a fetus as the conception, which goes back to historical ideas about ensoulment and quickening and lots of other things that we could talk about. But a fetus is distinct biologically from an embryo. And then it's only a baby at birth. So I know it's popular for people to talk about, oh, I had a picture of my baby or, oh, I started to feel my baby. I think I might be pregnant. And to think of that very early thing as a baby, it's interesting. I talked to my mom. I was born in 1950, so a long time ago. Talked to my mom and she said, I didn't. I had two miscarriages before you. I didn't think of it as a baby until really late because it was really just not comfortable to me to think of it that way. But today, there's a lot of pressure to think of that as a baby. So those terms start to have real social impact and also start to have legal and policy uses. And then roughly, and again, we don't know for sure, but roughly 30% of, um, of the fertilizations lead to miscarriage sorry, my phone's ringing and I can't make it go away. Okay, uh, lead to miscarriage, um, which is also called a spontaneous abortion um, sometimes. And that term abortion confuses things as if it was the woman's intention to have a miscarriage, but it technically, it fits because abortion technically is defined as termination of pregnancy and a miscarriage terminates the pregnancy. So those are all terms that, I'm talking about biology here, but also those are terms that are used in society and in policy and in law in various ways. Okay, so um, keep, keep those in mind, we'll come back to them, but to be clear, to focus on particular points here, um, conception in particular, has it's a very soci socially negotiated term, it doesn't have clear meaning or it has uh, multiple alternative, competitive, what people think are clear meanings. So that's something we really should talk a lot more about. And I wish that reporters, I wish that more science communicators when they're talking to scientists or when they're talking to legislators, when somebody says, well, you know, we have to protect life after conception. I wish they would stick their microphone and say, what do you mean by conception? You know, tell me what you mean. And then that's not what the definition says you know, here. So what, you know, anyway, I wish there were more open discussion about what that means. Similarly with contraception. Um, so in the last few months, as you might imagine, since the road decision um, and even a little before, uh, I was talking to a number of reporters and I talked to several, including one who was a senior at Berkeley who, who is a science and medical reporter or wants to be. 
And she said, tell me the difference between contraception and abortion. I've heard from legislators that contraception is a kind of abortion. So is that true? And I go, ah, in my head. But to her, I say, oh, well, I could see there would be that confusion, but let's talk about it. Contraception is stopping conception. Abortion occurs after there's implantation, after there's a pregnancy and not before that. So yes, the morning after pill, so-called plan B, and other forms of contraception are stopping the conception from happening, whatever we mean by that, but the fertilization and implantation from happening, but no, that's not an abortion. So if a law talks about abortion, it should not hold for those forms of contraception. So it's really important to be clear about that. And again, be clear what people mean when they use those terms and do they understand what they're talking about even. And then the point I just made, an embryo is not the same as a fetus, a fetus not, is not the same as a baby. Now there's a whole other world um, and discussion about what we mean by life or a life or being alive. And that is all super murky. And it's really muddled up with issues of personhood. And there are a lot of people in small groups who are minority groups, but very effective politically, who are working hard to get personhood and life defined as fertilization. And so I find that problematic for biological and social and lots of other reasons, but there is proposed legislation in a number of states along those lines, and we need to pay attention to it. And I have been serving as an expert witness for, um, for the courts, and I worked with my congressman and followed some policy discussions. And people even who are very concerned that we not become too restrictive about contraception or abortion don't know how to use the definitions to make clear what their views are. So I think, again, Roe kind of stopped us from really thinking about it very much and focused us on rights. And we really need to get back to some of these issues, as Jocelyn said at the beginning. OK, so let's come back to key terms again. So there are definitions. You know, abortion, we talked about um, the OED in particular, you know, expulsion or removal from the womb, which means uterus, of a developing embryo or fetus. Um, conception, that which is conceived in the womb. And so you see the OED doesn't help us here. You know, a conception is that which is conceived. Okay, what? Yeah, what's conceived? And then you look, oh, it's the thing that produces conception. Okay. Um, so, you know, we need a lot of work and what we mean there. Um, contraception is prevention of uterine. So uterine conception, but prevention of that means implantation. Um, so prevent anything up to that point miscarriage spontaneous expulsion before it's viable. So look at that interesting twist in the, in the OED about viability, introducing the idea of viability and all the discussions about that. And pregnancy is having an offspring developing in the uterus. So it's gotta be implanted and developing. It's not a pregnancy in the IVF dish, which one um, in Missouri, there was a proposal to, uh, to outlaw IVF because it was it was promoting pregnancy. Well, okay, yes, but not in the dish. Okay, but the most contested terms are these. So let's look at these. Person, an individual human being, a man, woman, or child. That's the OED definition. A man, woman, or child, not an embryo or a fetus. A man, woman, or child. Okay, so if we want to negotiate that and change it, we need to really think about what that means. Okay, more insidious, heartbeat. Okay, heartbeat, contraction of the heart by which blood is propelled around the body. Well, you have to have a heart to contract the heart and it has to have the four chambers and be able to contract and propel the blood around the body. And that happens not before about 20 weeks. What's interesting in legislation in the recent Dobbs ruling, uh, ruling on the Mississippi case that the Mississippi case talks about heartbeat at five or six weeks. Now that has been codified in law in a number of places and in medicine where they say, well, we're measuring heartbeat when we see that the individual heart muscle cells can slightly, can slightly contract and they're measuring it by taking a device. So there's a device to say, 
okay, is there a let? We're going to hold this up against the against the woman. Is there electrical activity in there? If it is, we're going to define it as heartbeat. Whoa, wait a minute. We let that happen. And that is now getting in a lot of laws and a lot of places. And that needs a lot of discussion. We had a lot of public discussion about what we mean by heart death. We need to look at what we mean by heart in innovation or beginning. Same with pain. There, that's in lots of places in law. The state or condition of consciousness arising from mental or physical suffering. Okay, in biology, we only have pain receptors and enough of a brain to receive them and have consciousness and have suffering at around 20 weeks, some say 24, not before 20 weeks. And yet pain in the Dobbs ruling in the Mississippi case and others, pain is defined as beginning at five or six weeks. Why? Because if you punch a woman in a stomach, there's a slight movement. So they're saying, oh, the fetus, which is really an embryo, is actually feeling pain. No, it's just floating in amniotic fluid. And when you push fluid, you know, things move around. So, okay. So that needs a lot of discussion. And it's not that science rules and tells us everything that we should do in society or in law and policy, but it, we should not be inconsistent with that and make up definitions that are inconsistent with the science. And there's a strong history, as Jocelyn said, history is really important. If we look back at um, history here, we, we see a, a, a particular path toward doing that. Fetal remains, this is where I've served as an expert witness in Texas, now Indiana and, and Minnesota, especially there are attempts to define the material, so OED, material from a pregnancy that does not continue, to define that material as remains and require that it be buried or cremated with due dignity and respect. And in some cases at the, at the woman's expense and in some cases at the state expense or with an opportunity that the Catholic Church will pay for it. But still, there are many women who find this awful that somehow at a very early stage, there was an embryo, there was a miscarriage, and now she is forced to deal with the fact that it is required to have a, a burial or a cremation. So there, you know, we need to pay attention. What do we mean by the material that's left? And then life, I just want to point to OED says it's the condition, quality, or fact of being a living person or animal, but um, being a living person, and that's where a lot of definition will have to happen. Okay, so therefore, you know, I'm saying, I'm arguing here, suggesting, you know, let's not let a small group define these terms and define the terms of debate. And they are doing that, and we are letting them have, have that opportunity. We are letting that happen. And we are being defensive rather than trying to take control. So my view is we should work together. We should try to define those terms. We should do it appropriately, respectfully, inclusively, consistently with science, never inconsistently, and with effective communication about the choices that are, that are being made. So that's my conclusion. I would love discussion. We have a little bit of time left. So um, Jocelyn, have you seen things that I should be we do. Do you want? Do you want to leave your your screen up, or do you want to unshare your screen, James? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to go stop sharing, and I'm just a little slow about it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Awesome. Oh well, I, this is such a fantastic talk and very provocative in all the best ways, I would say. Um, and you know, when when I was talking up your talk to to someone else uh, who is a science communicator, and I pointed out similar as I did in, in the introduction today about how it seems like abortion is often kind of left off the list of controversial topics that science communicators should be engaged with. Um, and this person responded like, "Oh well, I mean, that's because it's all like philosophical issues. Like scientists can't, you know, resolve the the question of like when life begins." And I'll, I do remember actually a biology, uh, my bio 101 teacher had a great response to that, which was life never ended, like the egg and the sperm were alive in a sense, cells are alive. So there is no, so it really is a question about personhood, as you alluded, which is also a philosophical question. But I think you highlighted lots of, of terms where, as you said, it's not that science is, you know, the be all end all for defining everything, but we should at least define these terms in ways that are not inconsistent with the science. Um, and we should be having these conversations. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. And when we define terms, it's too easy for people to say, oh, that's that's too philosophical. That's not for me. Oh, I don't know where definitions come from. But, you know, definitions come from people and and uses of terms over time. And then, yeah, there are officials who sit there somewhere you know, and, and figure it out. But uh, this is what we're going to put in the OD, OED or the you know, whatever the um, ghetto dictionary, yeah, whatever dictionaries they are. But um, but if we're not even discussing and not even at the table, so to speak, then they will end up defining terms. And I see that my that my friend um, and colleague Liz Barnes is here, and Liz does such wonderful work with looking at teaching of evolution and let's not make assumptions about what people think when they say they're religious and i think it's the same case with a with abortion i mean there's a and and everything related to it there's a tendency to say oh that, that person just identified as catholic so i know what they think but no let's find out what they think and let's talk about why they think it and let's work on things like okay what do you mean by conception do you know that it was 1869 and pope pius IX who made up a statement that life begins at conception without defining it but before that the catholic church endorsed abortion okay so you know so what what do you what do you think about that and how do you think about it let's not make assumptions about about what people think when they say they believe in that they're pro-choice or pro-right or pro-life. And actually, when I was asked um, by a judge in Texas, you know, when, when I was serving as an expert witness, um, do you, or I was asked by the opposition, um, and then the judge followed up, are you pro-choice or pro-life? And I said, yes, I'm pro having a diversity of views and working through what we mean by those. So I'm in favor of choices and I'm in favor of life. How can you not be? And the judge says, okay, okay. So you're saying these words are not really right. I said, yes. Anyway, yeah. And then and then we won that case, but yeah, temporarily. Amazing, I love that. So are you pro-choice or pro-life? Yes, that's gonna be my answer from now on too. That's yes, great. Yes, let's talk about what it means, yeah. Fantastic. So Taylor um, mentioned in, in a message to me that in addition to heartbeat, which I really, I feel ignorant, but did not realize that this, how, how the term heartbeat had been misdefined in talking about abortion. Fascinating. Um, but that she has seen on a billboard apparently in Lincoln about um, fingerprints and the fact that a fetus has fingerprints means it's alive. And I would assume maybe also a person. And so her question was, how do they even tell if it has fingerprints? And what is the justification for linking fingerprints to personhood? So I don't know if you've seen that or if you have thoughts on that, Jane. I haven't seen that billboard, but oh my goodness, yes. Oh, I have seen people um, people refer to paint fingerprints. Um, how do they know is a great question, but one way, I mean, there are some cases where, where fetal surgery is done and usually the fetus dies, but sometimes some like with, um, with spinal bifida and things like that, but, but um, so that, so people have found that there are fingerprints. Um, as far as I know, so I actually, actually tried to look this up last year and I couldn't find anybody who knows it's not clear whether it's the same fingerprint um you know whether it whether it changes but but who says a fingerprint means personhood or means life um does that mean if you have a burn and you lose your fingerprints you're dead I mean you're you're not alive yeah so there's so many questions so rather than saying oh they're idiots saying let's embrace that that's an interesting question let's work on what that means and why do you think fingerprints are important right right absolutely that is a great way to turn that into a conversation rather than a judgment fantastic we have one more minute and I'm, I'm kind of a bad moderator because I always monopolize the Q&A because I have so many questions myself. So I don't give people a chance to ask their own questions. Um, okay, let's see, question from Nadine coming in. Um, she's curious, how do you think we can deal with the situation where conversation is not possible? So she's um, uh, working with the, uh, the Personal Genome Project, I know, and write curricula on genetic technologies, including reproductive technologies. However, many teachers have let us know that they cannot currently teach anything that has words like abortion in it because of either backlash from the parents, rules from the school, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts on how we can still teach younger generations on these topics and terms? Well, that's such an important question. Yeah. And so, um, 
you know, where, where we don't have a conversation, but we're communicating to somebody, we can say, you may be thinking, you can imagine a conversation, you may be thinking, blah, blah, blah. But in some of these cases, you're right. Um, you were, we're blocked off from having discussions. And so that's one thing we're doing with the embryo project. Now we're working with something at ASU called ask a biologist, which reaches, I think it's now 35 million people a year or something, but, but, um, but we just developed a sexual reproduction game. And so we have a whole lot of information in there. Um, and it's an ask a biologist is targeted toward teachers. So it's a way kind of a backdoor way to try to communicate that. And we work with a lot of people and teachers on what it is that would be useful that they can point people to in a kind of informal way. Now, I live in Arizona. Arizona's crazy right now politically. So we have been told we cannot launch this game until after our governor's election because our governor candidate, you know, one of them is an idiot or what? <laughs> don't wait, take that out of the recording. But I don't know, that's okay, I'm proud to say that. Anyway, um, yes, but so there are other ways to communicate that we need to provide resources on the side. We need to provide materials and discussions that people can draw on. And then the other way is to imagine a conversation, imagine what people are thinking and, and really try to work through. What if you thought this here, this might be the case. And I know that's not perfect and it's a wonderful question. I'm also thinking about um, Beth Shirley's talk just earlier um, where she talked about her concept of dissociative framing, which is in some ways the opposite of what you've been talking about, Jane, but also not. It's a, it's a complementary strategy, I think, to basically decouple the conversation from terms that have been politicized. So kind of going against really doubling down and talking about those terms and making the terms and definitions the focus, decoupling from the politicized terms and recoupling it with other um, contextual circumstances that are of interest and relevance relevant and meaningful to the community. So I know that's not always possible, but that might be another. Uh... Yeah, yeah. No, and I, and that's, and that's great, but I, I want to take these terms head on because they are busily defining them and they are ending up in those terms are ending up in laws with these definitions that don't make sense in terms of the science and that have tremendous impact for women um, because of the way they're being really weaponized. Right, right. And you're, I like that you're holding us as scientists and us as science communicators accountable by saying we let that happen. Um, yeah, and we can't yeah. continue to let that happen. Me and you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. All you young people, fix it. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I feel motivated. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I learned a lot, Jane, and um, I hope that we can continue this conversation at other points during the conference, perhaps. And and certainly, I'm going to be putting together a bibliography, I think, of recommended readings by our speakers and sharing that with, with the participants, because there have been so many great uh, literature and, and resources shared in the talk. So I'll be hitting you up for that, Jane, and sharing it with everyone. We have a couple minutes to switch Zoom rooms before our next session begins. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jocelyn.